I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963. Thank you all so much for your prayers and support. God bless. Welcome to the Watchman channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In 2013, China's President Xi Jinping said that whoever controls data has the upper hand. Ever since, Xi has been on a technological quest to build what some call a blueprint for a digital dictatorship. It would not only allow China's communist government to control huge volumes of data on its own citizens, but also of those around the world. Dustin Carmack worked as chief of staff for the director of national intelligence. You're talking you know, vast amounts of data. They are running between both either covert or overt you know, cyber attacks and other realms. They are sucking up massive amounts of data around the globe that could have nefarious purposes in the long run. China has more than 415 million surveillance cameras deployed throughout the country, making its population by far the world's most watched. And now Beijing is using digital currency, social security cards, social credit systems and online interactions to keep an even closer eye on its citizens. It is a massive dragnet based on artificial intelligence, uh, facial recognition, voice recognition. These are all novel technologies that the Chinese Communist Party is deploying against its people. Jeffrey Kane, author of the new book, The Perfect Police State, an undercover odyssey into China's terrifying surveillance dystopia of the future, says the regime first tested this type of surveillance several years ago to monitor Uyghurs, an ethnic Muslim group living in the western part of the country. It's a place where everything they do from morning to night, from the, from the moment that they eat breakfast or go to the market or go to work, everything is monitored by their smartphones, by, by government cameras everywhere. There are millions of government cameras in this region. Um, and nothing is private, nothing is secret. Your entire life is exposed. Kane says his investigation found that those reams of data are fed to a massive police database. And with the help of artificial intelligence, attempts to predict whether or not someone will commit a crime in the future. But the thing is that the system has gotten out of control because, uh, you know, it, so I, I looked at a list of reasons that people can be detained for these pre-crimes. Um, and, you know, it could be something as simple as, you know, they, they bought a tent suddenly or they, you know, they stopped smoking suddenly. Um, they, they change their behavior in ways that the system finds odd. And then so it nudges the police. It sends the police a little, um, you know, on the app, a, a nudge to, you know, go to this person's house, to their work, to check them out, maybe interrogate them a little bit. And if the situation calls for it, take them away to one of many hundreds of concentration camps. China is accused of committing genocide against the Uyghurs by holding more than a million of them in what Beijing calls re-education camps. The Associated Press gaining exclusive access to one such detention center this summer that allegedly had room enough to hold more than 10,000 prisoners. When we talk about genocide, it's not just about taking lives, which there's evidence to suggest that's occurring too, but it's to erase a population, an ethnic group, and that's what they're after. Sophie Richardson with Human Rights Watch says President Xi also wants China to be the global leader in exporting its authoritarian surveillance tech to other like-minded regimes. So when they've got the kinds of tools that allow them, for example, to track their critics uh, every movement and control their access, for example, to money or even to buying plane or train tickets. You know, it makes it make it can make a state exponentially more powerful. New research from Oxford University and Berlin's Humboldt University uncovered some 1,800 active Chinese surveillance devices across 72 countries, including Venezuela, Kenya, Philippines, and Oman. China is now using their influence, their money. Uh, their technology to facilitate the repression of minorities and, and individuals in other countries. China has also deployed censorship devices in 17 other countries, 
among them Turkey, Cuba, Egypt and Pakistan, where news and media websites are blocked. I think the overall effect is to use technology to engineer a very particular kind of dissent-free society, and that's a very frightening concept. China used these and other tactics to suppress protesters in Hong Kong, then came to Cuba's aid in July by cutting communications after tens of thousands took to the streets protesting the regime. That type of technology being used to, to throttle uh, internet traffic flows or at times uh, in Cuba actually turn off the internet, especially in the early days of some of the protests down there. Meanwhile, new research shows that technology made by seven American companies, including IBM, Microsoft and Oracle, are facilitating China's surveillance of Uyghur Muslims with little to no consequences. I think that a lot of American companies have been caught with their pants down, frankly, because um, they spent the past two decades warming up to China, looking for market and business opportunities, profit opportunities, um, and now they've realized that they're, they're making a deal with the devil. A deal that is handing China a treasure trove of data in its quest for global information superiority and digital control over its citizens and those around the world. What we are witnessing is a glimpse of what the Antichrist beast system will look like. A man, I believe, who is alive and well today, will soon come on the world scene, seeming to have all the answers, and he will bring a false peace to the nations of the world. Three and a half years after this man comes on the world scene, his true intentions will become known. He will bring war the likes of this planet has never seen. And with war will come famine, pestilence, and death. The Bible refers to him as the Antichrist, and he will be welcomed by millions of those on earth not taken with the rapture. Unfortunately, his true identity will be known soon to those left behind that his true intentions are death, destruction, and control. What do we know about the Antichrist? The Antichrist has many names. The King of Fierce Countenance, the Prince who is to come, the Beast, the Son of Perdition, the Worthless Shepherd, the Man of Sin, the Lawless One. The first sealed judgment in the book of Revelation is the releasing of the Antichrist upon the earth. Revelation 6, 1 and 2. Now I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a voice like thunder, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a white horse. He who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. The Antichrist will be evil, yet appear as a savior. He will be outspoken and have great speaking ability. He will have a fierce countenance. The Antichrist will be extremely proud. He will not desire women. He will be a military genius. The Antichrist will be mortally wounded. He will be indwelt by Satan. He will come from a revived Roman Empire. The Antichrist will control a one-world government. He will control a one-world religion. He will control a one-world monetary system, known as the Mark of the Beast. It is evident that planet Earth is in the time Jesus refers to as the birth pains. The world is seeing death, destruction, and despair at unprecedented levels. The events the world is suffering through right now, awful as they are, will only get worse. The Bible tells us in the last days, right before Jesus returns. There will be a time of severe distress this world has never seen or ever will see again, as we read in Matthew 24, 21. For then there will be great tribulation, just as it has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. This time of distress Jesus is referring to is called the seven year tribulation in which the inhabitants of planet Earth who have rejected God and remain unrepentant in their sin will face his wrath. These terrible judgments are pictured as seven seals opened seven trumpets blown, and seven bowls poured out. The first four of the seven seals are known as the four horsemen of the apocalypse. The book of Revelation tells us when Jesus breaks the first seal and the white horse rides, the Antichrist will be unleashed. When Jesus breaks the second seal and the red horse rides, war will be unleashed. When Jesus breaks the third seal and the black horse rides, famine will be unleashed. When Jesus breaks the fourth seal and the pale horse rides, death and Hades will be unleashed. The Bible tells us 25% of the population of the earth will be killed at this time, as we read in Revelation 6-8. So I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and the name of him who sat on it was Death, and Hades followed with him. And power was given to them over a fourth of the earth, to kill with the sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beasts of the earth. The population of the world is roughly 8 billion, meaning 2 billion people will die during this time. The remaining 17 judgments of God include devastating earthquakes, cosmic disturbances, scorching heat, meteors, 100-pound hailstones, volcanic eruptions, loathsome sores on those who take the mark of the beast, 
The seas, rivers, and springs of water turned to blood, demons torturing mankind, and a 200 million strong demonic army who will kill another third of mankind, bringing the total to 4 billion. Okay, let's take a look at what's trending online right now. A video of a drone going around social media right now. So, Travis, what's so special about this drone? Uh, it walks. It oh. flies and it walks. Hmm. Hmm. Caltech sounds is like taking a, drones. Like a, a, like a drone bug. Kind a, of thing. That's right. Yeah. Uh, Caltech taking this to the next level here. They debuted this new drug, this new drone. They're calling it Leonardo or Leo for short. And the machine really does a lot more than just fly. Check it out. Here's Leo taking a walk right there. Uh, walks on, you know, upright on legs and then flies off, right? It's a hybrid robot drone, I guess. Walks and flies. The drone has two legs, bipedal, and while it walks along, then has propellers on its arms, basically, so it can take off. It can also apparently skateboard, walk a tightrope, and it looks a bit like maybe, I don't know, a precursor to the Terminator. Add some... <laughs> weaponry and I think we're in trouble. I for one welcome our new robot overlords. <laughs> yeah, I, I, it, eventually I think most of us are gonna have to, right? I mean I that think seems so. to be the direction we're going. Pretty much, yeah. Artificial intelligence. Is it predicted in the Bible? And the next question to ask is what do you mean by artificial intelligence? And there are many two kinds. There's narrow artificial intelligence, which is the kind that we're using all the time these days. And it has a lot of plus sides, particularly in medicine for rapid diagnosis. It has downsides in the surveillance economy and all the problems that are coming about through facial recognition being imposed on people. And a lot of ethical questions need to be thought about. But that is narrow AI, which is really hefty computing power working on big data to do something that normally requires human intelligence, one single thing. But then there's AGI, or, or artificial general intelligence. And the idea there, if you've read, for example, the book by Yuval Noah Harari, Homo Deus, where he says that the 21st century, the two big things that are going to happen are one, we're going to solve the problem of physical death as a technical problem. That's all it is. Secondly, we're going to enhance human happiness by re-engineering human beings, either by silicon implants, by turning us into cyborgs, or by upgrading us in some way. And some of our leading scientists are taking this seriously. Now, the title of that book, Homo Deus, the man who is God is very suggestive. And the irony to my mind, and this could lead to hours of lecturing, which you're not going to get, the irony to my mind is this. They are striving to produce a godlike human with super intelligence. Many of them are atheists. They don't realize there is a man who is God has already been on this planet. But he's not artificial intelligence, ladies and gentlemen. He's real intelligence, the intelligence of God made incarnate. So what interests me about this whole thing is what people are moving towards is a parody of a scenario that is embedded in Scripture. In the last days, the book of Daniel prophesied that knowledge would increase. Daniel 12.4 But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. Knowledge had to increase for future prophecy to be fulfilled. The biblical knowledge we have today is because of the increase in technology. This is a pretty good indicator that Christ will return very soon. There are many prophecies in Daniel's time that could not come to fulfillment because the technology had not yet been invented. That is why Daniel was told to shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. One of those prophecies is found in Matthew 24, verses 21 and 22. For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Flesh is the Greek word sarx, which means flesh, body, human nature, especially a human being. Matthew 24:22 can be translated like this. And unless those days were shortened, 
no human nature would be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. If Jesus did not return and shorten the days, there would be no human nature saved. Either mankind will merge with artificial intelligence, or artificial intelligence will completely destroy mankind as the dominant species. It's dystopian because of the extent to which we are visibly surveilled. Um, but I think that what's more dystopian for me is that it is normalized and that people are not um, responding much to this at all. It's another way, um, another means through which people feel surveilled, right? Where they feel like they might not be safe to um, articulate certain views or, or to engage in certain behaviors. I think that it all contributes to um, just sort of the the sense people have that they need to watch what they say and what they do in Singapore um, to a far greater extent than they would in other countries. God is omnipotent. He is all-powerful. God is omniscient. He is all-knowing. God is omnipresent. He is present everywhere. Satan, in sharp contrast, does not reflect these divine attributes. Satan is very powerful, more than any man, and more powerful than most angels. Satan wants to be like God, and even exalts himself above God, as we read in Isaiah 14, 12 through 14. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations, for you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation, on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Satan is not anywhere near to being equal with God. The only way Satan can be all-powerful, all-knowing, and present everywhere at once is through technology. When the Antichrist comes on the scene, he will undoubtedly use this type of technology as part of the beast system. There's probably no institution in American life that has more effect on how you live, but that we talk about less than the Federal Reserve. People don't care to talk about the Federal Reserve because it seems very complex, and a lot of what it does is in fact complex, unless you have a grounding in monetary policy. It's hard to know exactly what's going on. But the basics aren't that complicated, actually, and here are a few of them. The Federal Reserve was created way back in 1913 by an act of Congress, and it had really two main goals. Maximize employment and keep prices stable, keep inflation under control. Those are virtuous goals. But it may be a measure of the way that bureaucracies work that over time, the Federal Reserve has actively undermined both of those objectives. It's the classic story of the fireman turned arsonist, or for that matter, the COVID czar who helped create COVID. Irony of irony, it seems like we read a lot of those lately. In the case of the Federal Reserve, consider something called quantitative easing. That's the main thing the Fed has been doing since the financial crisis of 2008. Every month, Federal Reserve officials print more than 100 billion new dollars in American currency, and then they inject those dollars into our financial system by buying assets like bonds and securities. This is not a normal thing to do. It's a radical thing to do, and it was supposed to be temporary. It was in response to a crisis. In medical terms, quantitative easing is like chemotherapy. There are times when it can save your life, but fundamentally, it's poison. If you keep taking it, it will kill you. Pretty much everyone agrees on that. And pretty much everyone understands that ultimately quantitative easing causes horrible inflation. And it's easy to understand why. You don't need to be an expert. The more money you print, the less that money is worth. It's supply and demand. You buy diamonds by the carrot, but you buy dirt by the yard. Overabundance decreases value. So every new dollar you print buys less. If you keep printing them, you wind up devaluing your own currency. 
That's one thing a responsible government should never do. It may enrich banks and a tiny number of big investors who give to the Democratic Party, but devaluing your currency screws everyone who works and who saves. And that's immoral. Those are exactly the people that a legitimate government ought to be trying to help as its core mission. And yet they're not. All these years later, quantitative easing continues. They're still doing it. On Wall Street, they joke about how it's going to go on forever. They call it QE infinity. It's an incredibly reckless policy, and everybody knows it, very much including the people who are getting rich from it. So for the better part of a year, Fed officials have been promising they're going to stop doing this. They have sworn they will get sober. They have vowed to begin a process called tapering. That means they'll start to gradually slow the money they print. At a Fed meeting in April, officials said they'd start to do this very soon. They would taper, but they never did. They made the same promise throughout this summer, but again, they didn't. The binge continued. This morning, the vice chairman of the Fed, Richard Clarita, once again insisted that tapering is almost here. We're about to do it. The conditions to begin detox, he said, have all but been met. And yet, as of tonight, the Fed is still partying with your currency like this is the richest country in the world and always will be. So what are the effects on our country of this? Well, in the short term, as with vodka, it makes everybody feel pretty good. It's 3 a.m., your lips are numb, and you can barely see, and yet somehow the breakfast meeting downtown you've got in five hours, the one where you're going to have to give a detailed presentation to your boss, seems like no problem at all. You've got this, except you don't have it at all. Morning always comes. It is always worse than you think. America's quantitative easing hangover is going to be ugly. Beneath the manufactured euphoria of our top-line economic numbers, Google's killing it. Record profits for Amazon, says CNBC. Beneath all of that garbage, the actual American economy is in trouble, and there are many signs of it. Labor markets are tight right now because a lot of Americans have simply dropped out of the labor force. 4.3 million people walked off the job last month. Some of them were forced out by Joe Biden's vaccine mandates. Projections for GDP growth just dropped from 6% to 1.5%. Small businesses across the country are dying. And maybe most ominous of all, inflation is here. It's not just a temporary problem caused by COVID-disrupted supply chains. It is absolutely real. The American economy starting to sizzle once again as it emerges from the pandemic. And workers' paychecks are too, with businesses practically begging for help. But there's a flip side to all the raises, and that's inflation. Prices rising at the fastest rate since 2008. Everything from washing machines up almost 30 percent to furniture up 11 percent and television sets up 8 percent. So it's happening throughout the economy. It's not just washing machines and television sets, consumer electronics. It's everything, including the big things. Try to buy a house. It's now more expensive to buy a home than it has ever been at any time in American history. The median existing home price last year was $310,000. It's now over $356,000 and a lot more in the zip codes you might want to live in. Part of the reason is the cost of building materials. They're completely out of control. Last October, lumber went for about $580 per thousand board feet. As of last week, it was $712. Last August, used cars, which you might need, were selling for an average price of $21,000. This August, a year later, they were almost $28,000. Same car seven grand more. Over the same period, by the way, as you well know, the price of gas jumped a full dollar a gallon and a lot more than that in some places. But in the grocery lately, the cost of a pound of steak is up by two bucks. A pound of bacon costs over seven dollars right now. And suddenly everything costs more. Eggs, milk, coffee, mustard, etc., etc., etc. These are not luxury items. This is not a trip to St. Bart's. These are things you buy every week and you have to buy. The question is, are your wages rising as fast as your costs? Well, let's see. Vegetable oil is up 60%, so probably not. And that means you're getting poorer, whether you realize it or not. But that's what inflation does. It causes poverty. So because we can prove that the population of the United States is getting poorer by the day, you'd think the Biden administration would be actively concerned about this and working to make it better. But they're doing the opposite. They're actively making it much worse. And here's how they're doing it, by spending. No government in the history of the world has ever spent more money than Joe Biden is spending right now. That is a fact. In fiscal year 2019, just the other day, 
the entire federal government spent $6.6 trillion. Then COVID hit the following year, and those numbers went up. They went up by 40%. Federal spending in 2020 jumped to $9.1 trillion. Was that too much? Of course it was. What did we get for it? Not enough. But here's the shocking thing. Under Joe Biden, as COVID recedes, it's going up even higher because they're no longer using COVID as a pretext. Through the end of this August, which is to say a month and a half ago, the federal government has already spent more in 2021 than it did over the entire calendar years of 2019 and 2018. So all of this drives inflation to scary levels. But they're not scary to everyone. If you're a massively leveraged financial institution that owes a lot of money to a lot of people, and that's how you're making your money, this is not necessarily bad news. If money is worth less, that means that your debt service costs less. You don't fear inflation. Inflation helps you. The problem is it crushes the American middle class. Now, in a normal country, this would be a huge concern. But because the people who make our policy don't care about the middle class, this is a bargain well worth making. Bloomberg News just published a piece with this headline, which we're not making up. They're celebrating the disaster. Quote, America needs higher, longer lasting inflation. If you can even imagine writing something like this, does America need more emphysema too? It's grotesque. Now, most people may not know this is happening. Normal people don't read Bloomberg News. They may be unaware that these attitudes even exist in what they assumed was their country. And the Biden administration would like to keep it that way. would like to keep the population from finding out what's happening. So here's the Treasury Secretary, Janet Yellen. She's the reptile who once ran the Federal Reserve and is therefore more responsible than any single living person for your growing poverty. Here she is assuring you that $7 bacon isn't actually a problem. That's not really inflation. It's something called transitory inflation. I don't believe that we're at risk of hyperinflation. We've had several months of high inflation that um, most economists, including me, believe will be transitory um, as our economy gets back um, in, in full swing after the pandemic. It's just transitory. It's the price of progress, $7 bacon. Yeah, but look what you're getting in return. Aren't things great? Until just a few hours ago, that was the official line in Washington, along with those Southwest delays were caused by weather. And our withdrawal from Afghanistan was actually a huge success. What are you talking about? That's what they were telling us. And then the president of the Atlanta Fed, a man called Rafael Bostic, admitted what was very obvious to anyone who goes to the grocery store. This actually is inflation. It is real inflation. It is not transitory inflation. And it's going to be here for a long time. What he didn't say was that this is not an act of God. This isn't a hurricane. It's not an earthquake. It's not something we can't control. This is the result of decades of policy that have enriched a few and impoverished the many. When will the reckoning be for that? And what are the effects for you going forward? The Bible warns us of a time where there will be superinflation as we read in Revelation 6, 5, and 6. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come and see. So I looked, and behold, a black horse. And he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and the wine. In this prophecy, it will cost a day's wages just for a loaf of bread. We are not in the tribulation period yet, but we are getting extremely close. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A, admit that you're a sinner. B, believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C, call upon the name of the Lord and you will be saved. When a person comes to know Jesus as their savior, they are brought into a relationship with God that guarantees their salvation as eternally secure. To be clear, salvation is more than saying a prayer or making a decision for Christ. Salvation is a sovereign act of God whereby an unregenerate sinner is washed, renewed, and born again by the Holy Spirit 
as we read in John 3.3 and Titus 3.5. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. When salvation occurs, God gives the forgiven sinner a new heart and puts a new spirit within him, as we read in Ezekiel 36, 26. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. The spirit will cause the saved person to walk in obedience to God's word, as we read in Ezekiel 36, 27 and James 2, 26. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will keep my judgments and do them. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So what about repentance? Repentance is not a work we do to earn salvation. No one can repent and come to God unless God draws that person to himself. As we read in John 6:44, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Repentance is something God gives. It is only possible because of his grace. All of salvation, including repentance and faith, is a result of God drawing us, opening our eyes, and changing our hearts. God's long-suffering leads us to repentance, and so does his kindness, as we read in 2 Peter 3.9 and Romans 2.4. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? Ephesians 2.8 and 9 declares, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Works are not the cause of salvation. Works are the evidence of salvation. Faith in Christ always results in good works. The person who claims to be a Christian but lives in willful disobedience to Christ has a false or dead faith and is not saved. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. That is why John the Baptist called people to produce fruit in keeping with repentance, as we read in Matthew 3.8. Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. A person who has truly repented of his sin and exercised faith in Christ will give evidence of a changed life as we read in 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. A person who has not repented of their sin and exercised faith in Christ will give evidence of the works of the flesh, as we read in Galatians 5.19-21. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. A person who has crucified the flesh and belongs to Christ will give evidence of the Spirit, as we read in Galatians, 5:22 through 24. But the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Believers are born again, regenerated when they believe. For a Christian to lose his salvation, he would have to be unregenerated. The Bible gives no evidence that the new birth can be taken away. The Holy Spirit indwells all believers, as we read in John 14, 17. The Spirit of Truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him or knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. The Holy Spirit baptizes all believers into the body of Christ, as we read in 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves are free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. For a believer to become unsaved, he would have to be unindwelt and detached from the body of Christ. John 3.15 states that whoever believes in Jesus Christ will have eternal life. 
If you believe in Christ today and have eternal life, but lose it tomorrow, then it was never eternal at all. Hence, if you lose your salvation, the promises of eternal life in the Bible would be in error. Scripture says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Remember, the same God who saved you is the same God who will keep you. Once we are saved, we are always saved. Praise God, our salvation is most definitely, eternally secure. Time is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready! Uh -huh.